Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about ASCII and about one of the little details of ASCII, which I personally think is really clever, the way that it uses a single bit to encode the difference between uppercase and lowercase letters. And then last week, we were talking about Unicode and the challenges of normalization. How do we decide if two different strings should be considered equivalent or not? Well, as you can imagine, it turns out this is a big topic. At one extreme, we have the kind of scenarios we looked at last week, where we have two strings that look the same, they render the same on every device, they mean the same thing, but the underlying pattern of bits is not exactly the same. And so in some scenarios, the computer's gonna treat them as not being equal. And then at the other extreme, there's reality where the official government name in somebody's passport is Alexander, but everyone calls them Sasha. And so we've got two different strings, different bits, different lengths, representing different words written in different alphabets. But we're happy to say, oh yeah, Sasha, yes, that's the same person, that's fine. One of the most common scenarios where this crops up in everyday life is case sensitivity. But before we talk about case sensitivity, we probably need to define what case actually means here. Alphabets that use two separate cases, they're known as bicameral scripts, and they're actually in the minority. The vast majority of writing systems used around the world are what's called unicameral. Every letter or character, symbol, glyph, rune, whatever the applicable term is, it only exists in one variant. But most alphabets used in Europe have evolved from Latin, Cyrillic, or Greek, where every letter comes in two variants. There's uppercase and there's lowercase. And the theory is that uppercase was used in stonemasonry, which <laughs> kind of makes sense. It's uh, really hard to chisel curves into stone, and uppercase letters tend to have a lot more straight lines. And lowercase variations developed when handwriting became widely established. And then around the point that industrial printing was developed about 500 years ago, it all sort of got mashed together. The names we use, those definitely come from printing. Uh, typesetters kept all of their metal letter forms in wooden cases, and the small letters were used more often, so they were kept in the lower case, where they were easier to reach, and the capital letters were kept in the upper case. And you'll also sometimes hear folks talk about majuscules and minuscules, and if you want to sound really fancy, you can describe letters as majuscular or minuscular, but we'll stick to uppercase and lowercase for today. Now, I said there that every letter comes in two variants, and that's mostly true. Uh, one of the big challenges for a standardization project is the number of bizarre edge cases that have been around for centuries and just never really been a problem until computers got involved. This letter is called S-set. It's used in Germany, where it's sometimes known as the sharp S. Uh, it was originally a combination of an S and a Z. It's been used in written German since about the 14th century, but only in Germany. It's not used in Switzerland or Liechtenstein, and only in lower case. There's a heavy metal bar in Berlin. It's called the Rock Cafe Halford. It's awesome, definitely worth visiting next time you're there. Um, it's on a street called Mainzerstrasse. And for a long while, if you had to write that address in uppercase, you had a problem because there was no uppercase S set. Now this is partly due to a, just a weird quirk of German orthography. Like many European languages, uh, German spells proper nouns, names of people and places with a capital initial, but the S set, it lengthens the pronunciation of the preceding vowel sound. So Strasse, not Strasse, which means it always has to come after a vowel, and so it can never be the first letter of a word. So if you did need to write Mainzer Strasse in uppercase, you had a choice. You could just leave the S set there in lowercase, which this apparently looks weird if you're used to reading German, or you turn it into two capital S's. So now you're not just dealing with a letter that only exists in lowercase, now you've got words that might actually get longer if you convert them to capitals. Now, it's not strictly true to say there was no such thing as an uppercase S set. A lot of type designers and sign writers came up with their own versions, but it wasn't until 2017, it's less than a decade ago, that the Council for German Orthography officially adopted an uppercase S set, and Unicode added it a year later, code point 1E9E, Latin capital letter sharp S. But if you ask JavaScript to convert Mainzerstrasse to uppercase, you still get the double S. Now, 
too uppercase in JavaScript. It's based on something called an invariant culture. And uh, as you'll know all too well, if you've been following along with the series, Unicode and software designed to work with it often gives us developers a whole bunch of options if the defaults don't do quite the right thing. JavaScript also has too locale uppercase, which lets us say, hey, what would this string look like if a German speaker in Germany converted it to uppercase? But even when we specify the locale, we still get the double, double capital S. JavaScript 1, Council for German Orthography nil. It turns out there is a huge difference between making something official and actually getting people and computers to use it. What's particularly interesting, though, is if we reverse it, we don't get our S set back. Uh, that's because Unicode and the locale support that's baked into JavaScript, they're based on letters, not words. Once we've uppercased it, we've lost the fact that it used to be an S set. Now it's just two Latin capital letter S's. And if there was a rule that said, hey, if you see two capital S's, then lowercasing should turn them into an S set. Well, no, there's plenty of words in German that use a regular double S. Like if Michael Fassbender was going to Essen to visit the Tessenschloss, to visit the Countess, you'd say Michael Fassbender wird in Essen die Contessa am Schloss Tessen besuchen, which is full of double S's that shouldn't be replaced by an S set. Um, somebody will now leave a comment that Schloss used to be spelled with an S set and it should never have been changed. Well, that's what makes the intersection of technology and linguistics so interesting. Everybody has an opinion about how it should work, and they don't always agree. But with this scenario, we've reached the limit of what's possible with the raw data. To get this one right, we need external context. We'd need to refer each word to some kind of lookup table that tells us which ones get an S set and which ones keep their double S. And that's the point where Unicode says, nope, you are on your own. Good luck. But while we're here, let's try this. We're going to uppercase Mainzestrasse using the TR locale. That's Turkish. And Turkish has one of my favorite orthographic quirks of any writing system. Turkish has two variants of the letter I. There's an I with a dot, and there's an I without a dot. Okay, big deal, you're thinking. We have that in English, but no, no, no. In Turkish, there is a capital dotted I and a lowercase dotless I. And what makes this particularly delightful is that the lowercase dotted I, that's the same one we have in English, but when you uppercase it using a Turkish locale, you get one of these. It's an uppercase I with a dot on it. Now, uh, FIFOR left a really interesting comment on the last video. Uh, one thing I think Unicode did wrong was letting things that look the same be created with different code points. I understand why they did it, I just think it was the wrong decision. And yes, mostly that's what Unicode does. Uh, the Cyrillic letter S and the Latin letter C, they are the same shape, they normally represent the same sound, but they are assigned separate code points because they belong to different alphabets. And as FIFOR points out in the comment, this means you can create web and email addresses that look legitimate. Uh, this looks like Microsoft.com, but the C there, that's actually a Cyrillic lowercase letter S. Now, this is a topic for another video. The reason that I bring it up here is Turkish is a rare counterexample. Because the Turkish alphabet is based on Latin, Unicode decided that the variants of the Turkish I that already exist in Latin, they'll be encoded using the existing code points. So the lowercase dotted I and the uppercase dot less I, uh, those are regular 7-bit ASCII, but their majuscular and minuscular counterparts, those got completely new code points. So now we've got German, where words might change length if you uppercase them, and we've got Turkish, where 7-bit ASCII could end up as extended Unicode just by making it uppercase. And of course, we're not just talking about string comparison here. We're also talking about sorting. Pretty much every language, culture, and alphabet on this planet, it has some kind of notion of alphabetical order, a way of looking at two bits of text and deciding that one of them should be sorted before the other one. And it turns out these two concepts, equality and ordering, they're absolutely fundamental to just about any real world data storage system. Now, uh, take a look at these lists. Uh, which one is in alphabetical order? Well, it depends. Bunch of folks out there go, no, what? Alphabetical order can't depend. Friends, welcome to the wonderful world of collations. We are gonna create a database of European cities. Now I'm using Microsoft SQL Server here. Support for these kinds of scenarios, it varies quite a lot between different database providers, but I've run systems like this on SQL Server in production for literally decades, and it's never let me down yet, so that's what I'm gonna use. So we'll create a table, 
and then we'll insert a bunch of cities into it. Aachen, Aarhus, Berlin, London, Erebru, and uh, Zurich. All right, let's retrieve London. That's weird. What happened to London? Yep, case sensitivity. There is no city called London with a lowercase l. There is only London with an uppercase l. All right, so what about Erebru? Well, uh, even if we get the case right, this isn't going to find it, because according to the default rules in this database, that letter there, O, that's not the same as the Swedish letter E. If we want this to work, we are going to need to specify a collation. It's a set of rules that defines which strings are considered equal, and if two strings aren't equal, which one comes first. So if we say, hey, find me Ourobro using Latin case insensitive accent insensitive collation, that's telling the database engine we don't care about upper and lower case and we don't care about accented characters. And voila, there it is. Now, if we select star from cities order by name, we get this. This is SQL Server's default collation. To me, as a native British English speaker, this makes sense. Because I didn't grow up with the letter E, and so in my British English brain, Ourobro is spelt with an O. But if we do the same thing, and we specify we want to use the Finnish-Swedish collation, we get this. Ourobro has moved after Zurich, because in Finland and Sweden, the letter E comes after the letter Z. Now, look at what happens if we specify Danish and Norwegian. Now, at this point, the Danish and Norwegian viewers are going, yeah, and? And the rest of the world is going, sorry, what? In 1948, there was a thing called the Danish spelling reform. There were three new letters added to the Danish alphabet, and the rule was that names that started with or, A-A, would now be spelled with a new letter or, and so they would move to the end of the alphabet. Now, Aarhus is uh, Denmark's second largest city after Copenhagen, and so in 1948, Aarhus changed its name from Aarhus to Aarhus, but then in 2010, the Aarhus City Council voted to change it back. But, and, and this is the fun part, the rules of Danish orthography say that place names starting with AA should still be treated as the letter OR for sorting purposes, but only if they are places in Scandinavia. So Aarhus is in Denmark, and it belongs at the end of the list, after Zurich. But Aachen, that's in Germany, and so it belongs at the beginning of the list, before Berlin. But SQL Server doesn't know that. It's just like Mainzerstrasser and Michael Fassbender. We've reached the point where getting this right requires more information than is actually encoded in the text. If it's an absolutely hard requirement that your system puts Orhus at the end and Aachen at the beginning, you're going to have to add another column to your data schema. So you've got one column for the text you show to your human users and another column with a sorting key that you can use if you need to override the underlying collation rules. Folks, next week we are going to round out this little series about text encoding with the story of the day we found Chinese in the Windows event logs. We're going to talk about how to write HTML in Ukrainian, and we're going to look at one of the most brilliant, elegant hacks in the history of computer science. Until then, folks, I hope you found that interesting. You all have a good week out there. You look after each other, and I'll catch you next time.